The risk of acting without good evidence of impact on polit politics, I'm not talking health disinformation, I'm not talking individual terrorism, I'm talking large-scale political outcomes at the population level, is that we're faced with this sense of loss of confidence in the political system, more or less wise intervention by private companies that start to see themselves as the stewards of democratic discourse, and worse, perhaps of all, a decline of academic normative intuitions among those who should know best. He has a vast CV. I'm not going to go through it, but I will mention uh, two of his books. Um, the first, the 2006 book, The Wealth of Networks, How Social Production Transforms Markets and Freedom. And the second, uh, 2018 co-authored book, Network Propaganda, Manipulation, Disinformation, and Radicalization in American Politics. Um, since you urged me not to go through your CV, I'll stop there. Perfect. It's very long and impressive, and so you can go find that. There's a link on the website. Or you today. can skip it. Or you can <laughs> skip it. It's your choice. Uh, today, uh, his, uh, Professor uh, Beckler's talk is titled, Don't Panic, It's Just the Collapse of Neoliberalism. So let's... <laughs> Today I won't communicate so much knowledge as doubt. Um, we all know 2016, Brexit, the Trump election taking over the Republican Party away from where it was for a long time before. The OED calls, <coughs> uh, 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 calls post-truth the word of the year in 2016. Uh, this set of stories about how fake news online is outperforming mainstream news on Facebook. Uh, we have Pizzagate. We have the point by December, uh, by December of uh, uh, 2016, where 46 percent of Trump voters say they believe there is some connection between the Clinton campaign and pedophilia. Uh, there is a moment of tremendous concern that out-of-control technological processes have fundamentally disabled our capacity to tell truth from fiction. And if we broadly map the, the, the threats that were the core of the discussion over the course of the following year, they mostly fell around technological issues, um, uh, whether if it was Russia and it was political, then it was bots and hackers and sock puppets. If it was more commercial, then it was Facebook algorithms or Cambridge Analytica. Uh, or filter bubbles. Um, <clears throat> relatively few arguments, primarily our team focused on institutional explanations. Uh, and the result, among many others, was an explosion of research. David and Matt led us in this, many, many uh, 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 people saying we need a science of fake news. We've had a tremendous amount of both quantitative and qualitative uh, data uh, 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 and research developing in trying to identify this information, define it, uh, diagnose where it happens, how it moves um, um, across the board and across a diverse set of disciplines. Our own contribution, uh, co-authored with Rob Farris, one of my co-authors back there in the back, uh, uh, and Hal Roberts, uh, has been, was <coughs> to develop uh, or to use a system we've been developing for over a decade to analyze, in our case, four million stories, two million from the election period, two million from the year after, how these stories were shared, uh, how they were linked, what sort of authority they created with each other, how they were shared on Twitter, uh, how often they were shared on Facebook, using text analysis and qualitative analysis to try to get insight across multiple media, and this was central to us. We also connected some analysis of TV, um, uh, to be able to say something on the broad media ecosystem about where disinformation came from, uh, how it flowed. Uh, but as I said, this is part of a much bigger explosion that this speaker series is obviously part of, as is the misinformation review uh, uh, that you launched not long ago. Um, at the same time, we continue to have in the public sphere massive concern about disinformation. So I just picked a few stories from the last week, uh, not because they're the most important, just because they were a day or two ago. Uh, we have, uh, again, the, the uh, report to Congress, 
and the controversy with Trump over the report to Congress about Russian efforts. We have the, the alert to Bernie Sanders uh, and his concern. One of the critical things that's happening is that uh, there's broad concern about the um, <clears throat> uh, integrity of the election, irrespective of actual evidence of influence. And whether or not there is in fact influence, there's a broad perception and already a cost of undermining um, uh, um, um, confidence in an election, which is fine if the confidence is false and is really bad and a high cost if in fact the Russian influence isn't um, um, uh, as important. Similarly, we just had this uh, uh, new, it's not even a study, it's, a, it's an uh, early working paper, it seems. Already it's up on the front page, bots are shaping climate uh, 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 action. Um, we have platforms like Twitter moving in to decide to intervene in the structure of a, uh, a political campaign. Again, only susceptible to being understood on the background of a sense that technology is overwhelming our ability as a, uh, uh, as a society to deal with, with democratic uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, we're seeing uh, this new uh, uh, leaked rollout of Twitter's efforts. And what you see the examples are, we, a private company, are going to put up stark signals. And we've heard stories here about how effective they are or not at the individual level with a model of political understanding that we're going to do on the fly color-coded fact-checking to um, uh, politicians. We're going to show you that we're going to be neutral between both sides. We're going to have something from Kevin McCarthy, something from Bernie Sanders. Uh, uh, to me, this is not a, a, strong, a, a powerful sign. Uh, we're seeing the explosion of fear around deep fakes, even though there's a lovely little still working paper that just came around the other day uh, uh, from a couple of people, I think both of whom have already spoken here among, among the co-authors. Um, uh, uh, on a group at MIT experimentally showing that the difference between video and text in terms of its influence may not be quite as big uh, as we think. And this translates to what really for me triggered this talk. If there was one event that triggered this talk for me, it was the idea of the Democratic Speaker of the House staff turning to major private platforms to take down a video, which was essentially a brilliant piece of propaganda by her primary opponent. What did she do? She made a grand gesture at the end of the State of the Union to rip the, the um, uh, speech apart. What did his team do? They took the most heart-tugging moments of the speech, a Tuskegee Airman honored a uh, black woman and her daughter as the daughter is receiving a scholarship to go to school and interlace the images of those people with hair tearing up. That's fake video that we need Twitter to be able to take down and that's already a context in which um, uh, uh, this is already the Democratic Speaker of the House, supposedly the less in the middle of the, of the campaign. Uh, to me, this was a signal of moral panic and an autoimmune response to a genuine thing that's happening out there. By moral panic, I mean we all suddenly find something that we really believe there's some evil out there that's coming to get us all and overwhelming us. And the autoimmune response aspect to it, which is to me in that regard, like terrorism, like the fear of crime waves that are overstated, where the response to the perceived threat is the primary vector of disease. And that's what I'm worried about. So to me, what I want to focus on today is how we assess how important the things we are afraid of really is. How bad the impact is. Because to me, these costs, undermining our sense of the integrity of our election system, undermining our ability to think straight about what counts as political hardball and what counts as illegitimate propaganda to the point that we want to bring private parties to shut it up. That to me is critical and the science as opposed to moral side of it or normative side of it is what are we trying to measure and who has done any work on it and what should we learn and how afraid should we be? Don't panic. Um, 
So let's start to dig at a couple of these examples specifically. So Clinton pedophilia, right? This was anatomy of a fake news scandal, vile classified materials on Wiener's divides made Bill and Hillary on their pedophilia billionaire friends plane. Yep, Hillary has a well-documented predilection for underage girls. Where did this come from? Remember, nearly half of Trump voters thought there was something to this. It's not two or three people. Where did it come from? Well, we were fortunate enough that in May of 2016, two Jeffrey Epstein-related stories surfaced on both sides of the uh, political spectrum. One was a uh, criminal complaint, was a civil complaint uh, asserting that Trump had raped the complainant, the, the plaintiff, um, uh, as a 13-year-old at a party by Jeffrey Epstein. The other. Uh, this idea that Bill Clinton, and later on it got layered in that it was Hillary too, much later, uh, flew to Pedophilia Island on the Lolita Express uh, uh, owned by Jeffrey Epstein. Now when we looked only at the worst Facebook bullshit sites, those that really had almost no presence outside of Facebook and had a very high quotient of nonsense, there was as much supply of stories about Trump rape as there was on the right, in fact there was more as there was on the right of the Clinton pedophilia uh, story. They existed on both sides. This, face, this Huffington Post, which was not he did it, it's we can't ignore it given who he is, got well over a million shares uh, uh, of various sorts. The critical difference emerged when we moved from these worst actors to the main players in the media ecosystem. On the left, and as you'll see soon, I won't call it the left, I'll call it the rest. It's almost no attention to either one. And if anything, a little more attention to the Clinton pedophilia story uh, 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 than not. On the right, this is based on the most linked to media. The media that got the most inlicks had the most authority in the web. On the right, there's persistent attention to the Clinton pedophilia. Even on the left, there's more attention to the Clinton pedophilia stories than there is in response to these than there is to the Trump uh, uh, rape. Similarly, in regard to Twitter, uh, when we look at the most tweeted sites, you have a completely different response on the top most tweeted sites than you do elsewhere. What happened was essentially, as soon as this story came out, within two or three days, you had investigative journalism across the left wing of the media ecosystem, basically identifying the source of the complaint as a Republican anti-Trump guy who um, uh, was trying to knock him down and has a history of producing these kinds of, of, of um, uh, uh, false stories. On the right, by contrast, the origin, the origin is Fox News Online. The original documentation is a FOIA request by a Fox News reporter, the same reporter who later on uh, did the Seth, the, the Seth Rich version uh, uh, story for Fox News. And then it flows from there across the media ecosystem but I will say, more importantly, it makes it to the 6 o'clock news and then moves to Hannity and Newt Gingrich talks about it when it comes back. So remember, it's a FOIA request by a reporter. This is not hacking by Russians. This is not bots. Uh, um, the major points of connection are Comey reopening the investigation to remember that initial Wiener's laptop. That's Comey opening the investigation. That vastly explodes the story. Who are the people pushing this story? It's Eric Prince on Breitbart Sirius XM, it's Michael Flynn tweeting it out. That's the, those are the vectors of transmission, rather than thinking about Russians or bots or Facebook algorithms. That's at the level of the small details of, of how it actually happened. At the broad level, the biggest, most sustained, and most robust result of our study was that the American media ecosystem is split in two, but it's not left versus right, it's right versus rest. There is an insular right-wing media ecosystem, and I'm happy to dig into the details later, but I presented them here before, so I'm not going to. Uh, whether we measure it by online links, whether we measure it by tweets, there's a discrete insular right-wing media ecosystem that is very internal, and there is a broadly interconnected left-center um, 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 media ecosystem that is centered on traditional media, whereas in the right, it was centered during the election when Trump was 
uh, really an outsider to the Republican Party on Breitbart, but then Fox around, actually their biggest story that brought them back into the center of the system was the pedophilia story. Uh, Fox News uh, moves over the course of later 2016 and 2017 into the core. Why is this important when I say media ecosystem, particularly for politics and mass media? Right after the election, Pew have a study of what are the sources of, of um, uh, information. Differences, they focused correctly on the fact that Fox News is the dominant source as your primary source of news relative to a much wider distribution uh, for Clinton supporters. But let me also show you here Facebook 8%, Facebook 7%. Facebook doesn't seem to be, and online doesn't seem to be, when you're talking about a political system for a population as a whole, about the experience elites have about how they interact with things, doesn't seem to be as important within a media ecosystem that includes all of these. It includes the advertising, and includes the news cycle, and includes the public uh, announcements. Um, just to give you a feel, when we did look at the Seth Rich conspiracy, this measures the number of sentences that we can find online over the uh, uh, two-year period that mentions Seth Rich. Here is when the original event occurs, when, when, when Rich is murdered, when there starts circulating materials that may or may not be Russian, certainly are very fringe, um, uh, some alt-right, some otherwise, trying to push it on Twitter. This spike of coverage occurs when WikiLeaks offers the, the prize, uh, $20,000 prize for information leading to the uh, capture of whoever murdered, strongly implying that it's not Russia who hacked the DNC, it's Seth Rich who leaked the materials. This is the height of it during the election. This is the number of online stories, online stories responding to Fox News, Fox and Friends, Fox DC, Fox Online, and later on Hannity and throughout the day, end up reviving the Seth Rich conspiracy essentially as a way of diverting attention from the firing of Comey and the appointment of Mueller. That's when it happens. It becomes the big story uh, uh, here. So this is just to give you a little bit of a sense of the magnitude of the impact online of there being a major mass media campaign in terms of the number of stories uh, uh, around it. Just an effort, an imperfect effort to measure using the tools we have for gazing online on the relative impact of mass media versus not. I can spend three hours on this slide, so I'll just put it up here, and I'll invite you to make me happy and ask me about it. Uh, the core claim is this. When we try to understand why the right is different from the left, we cannot provide, to my taste, any useful explanation that talks about technologies that are shared across both sides of the divide. If anything, because Democrats skew a little younger, they use these technologies more, and so the effect should have been reversed if it were in fact filter bubbles or whatever it was. Instead, we have a long, careful chapter where we trace the political culture history of the United States, the regulatory story, and the technology story, where the short version is in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. There was an explosion of channels on mass media when we moved from one newspaper town and three broadcast news stations to cable news and AM radio. This explosion of channels changed the business model such that instead of programming to one-third of all the audience, if you were able to offer a unique product to 20, 25, 30% of the uh, population, you had a better business model than competing with the other three or four before you. The person who proved this market was Rush Limbaugh, who started to make money in spades in 88, right after the Fairness Doctrine removed the last regulatory uh, the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine removed the last regulatory constraint and then uh, national syndication. 96, Telecommunications Act allowed also for consolidation, so we got I, what is now iHeartRadio, what was then Clear Channel, buying Premier and creating Coast to Coast, Morning to Night, Hannity on Radio, Limbaugh on Radio, um, um, uh, and then eight years later, Fox arrives. By the time MSNBC and Air America tried to switch in the mid-2000s, the right had had 20 years to get used to the salt, fat, and sugar mix 
of identity confirmation. This is what essentially the outrage industry is. It gives you the stuff that gives you a quick hit quickly in terms of reaffirming your identity of us versus them. And it's very hard, as we know, to overcome that combination when we're talking about um, uh, diet. There's no reason to think otherwise. By the time Breitbart comes along, there is no business model on the right where you can actually come in and provide straight news. You'll just be ignored. And so you have to play in that game. It's the only game. Then you're a politician, and you can't afford. Just ask Mitt Romney voting against um, um, Trump. You can't afford to step out of line, because the entire media ecosystem is designed to police deviation from tribal identity, not deviation from the truth. And all of this precedes any of the, um, any of the online stuff and is more than enough to explain it. Well, what about the Russians? Well, there is no doubt that they're trying. Um, a couple of things that came out of our work that I'll sort of give you as examples suggest that the evidence of impact is marginal. Uh, the, the, if, to the extent there is an impact, it's coming through the, uh, uh, um, the outrage industry, picking it up and communicating it. And this is really, in some sense, the most important thing I want you to take away from Don't Panic. It's critically important not to overstate the impact of Russia, because everything we know about Russian propaganda, both how it, start, both how it operates internally and how they used it in their near periphery to a much greater extent than us, the point is not to get across one particular position. The point is to sow confusion, uncertainty, dislocation, and the primary vector of that today is our overreaction without measurement that they actually did uh, what they did. So that's the critical driving force. So let's look at the things we know really mattered. Email. This is uh, September 18th. Gallup comes out with a, with, a, uh, with a poll that says, what do you think of when you think Clinton? What do you think of when you think uh, uh, Trump? And the answer is, when you think Clinton, you think email. OK, so DNC hacks is Russians, Podesta email hacks. If that really drove the framework, that's a big impact. That's a huge impact. However, when we actually look at news coverage, notice two things. First of all, the Gallup poll comes here before the Podesta email uh, dump. The only Russian thing in this entire year and a half period of discussions about the State Department releases from the State Department, releases from the Inspector General, releases from the FBI, releases from the Department of Justice, announcements by Comey, retracting, adding, all come from FOIA requests by the Judicial Watch a little bit, but mostly formal government officials doing what they understand to be their job releasing, and media driven to try to be neutral between the two parties and, 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 and uh, uh, distressed about Trump's perspectives, and so covering all of the negative uh, views of him by weighing back with Clinton scandals as coverage. So this is the only spike we see that's really Russia-related until this point here at Podesta after this uh, Gallup poll. And even this is completely overshadowed. At the time, first of all, there's a lot more coverage of, of Access Hollywood. Uh, although the timing is pretty suspicious as, as presumably an effort to, to run interference on that in terms of the Podesta email dump. Uh, and the Comey announcement of reopening the, Wien the Wiener platform completely overwhelms every, any other topic of coverage uh, uh, during the election. This is a way for us to describe the top 50 mainstream sites and how they covered Clinton and Trump. And the answer is Clinton, it's almost all scandals. Trump, it's almost all issues. As Tom Patterson's group showed, it's all negative. They're equally neutrally negative about both, but they agree with Clinton, so what, what, what they have to say is scandals uh, rather than not. Um, let's take another example. Here, what we did was we dug into the uh, Mueller indictment of the IRA to identify assertions about specific instances of Russian propaganda. And we tried to see, did they matter? So this is a segment in the indictment that basically says, here's a Facebook group that pushed voter fraud on these days. Here's a Twitter uh, handle that pushed voter fraud on those days. And we looked at every single story that included terms to voter fraud in the year and a half of the, uh, uh, prior to the election. And in fact, during these days, there are two significant bumps, one obviously more than the other. So again, 
if we can trace, by zooming into the timeline, uh, if we can trace this change in the public conversation to voter fraud to the Russians, that's a big impact. That's important. Well, but the problem is that when we zoom in, and I'll do first this, then this, when we do zoom in, what do we find? We find Trump in a Reddit AMA says, voter fraud is always a serious concern. That's covered as, can you believe he said this? This is terrible, horrible, no good by the Washington Post, ABC, PBS, etc. Then three court opinions in Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Kansas um, uh, uh, invalidate voter suppression measures passed by Republican legislatures under the umbrella of uh, uh, avoiding voter fraud. That creates both outrage and a major outcry by Trump about how the courts are trying to uh, get the election rigged. A lot of coverage throughout the media after that. And only here, after, uh, after it's yesterday's mashed potatoes, does the Russian intervention come in. And as you can see. Uh, so if what's happening here is not put in the mastermind, comes and inserts into American conversation, the thing that shapes our perspective on what's going on. But instead, a bunch of guys sitting in St. Petersburg are saying, ooh, there was that thing yesterday, let's post something. We cannot allow that to shape our internal policies of what it is that we do. Same thing with the bigger spike, essentially Trump has a big tweet that says the election is going to be uh, tweeted. Uh, Pelosi and Reid respond and say, McConnell, uh, uh, Ryan, you can't not stand out. You have to support the integrity of the election. S massive spike in coverage of this controversy. On the way down, the Russians see, oh, there's a bandwagon. Um, <clears throat> we do find, I, I, I want to make sure I, I, I have time for other things, so eh, I have time. Uh, <laughs> we do find, we have one example where we're reasonably confident we can say, yeah, this one came from the Russians. And that's this, this idea that, that John Podesta participated in satanic rituals. Um, uh, first of all, how many of you have heard of this story before? Not through a talk of mine. Okay, it wasn't completely dominant in the way that if I had asked, how many of you have heard that there was an issue with emails with Clinton? How many of you have heard? Uh, okay, thank you. So it wasn't a dominant issue. But we were able to actually trace it uh, very much to this post on a small blog, po blog uh, uh, that's a side show of somebody whose main job at the time was a Sputnik reporter. And then using a tool uh, 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 that Justin Clark, one of our team, developed, uh, when we traced down to the minute level across Reddit, uh, uh, 4chan, uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook, where it comes, we see that it starts about 10 hours before that blog post on Reddit. There's some activity on the, uh, uh, on the chance, where we don't have complete coverage of that. Then there's the blog post, then there's a period of moderate activity around Twitter and Facebook. There's some, um, uh, the first Facebook post comes from WikiLeaks reposting this story. There's a little bit of background low level tweeting, but no particular spikes or particular attention. And then, and then at 8 a.m., Alex Jones comes out with a story on Infowars. 20 minutes later, it's on Drudge. Within three hours, it's all across the Washington Times to Laura Ingram. And by 11 AM, it's on Hannity uh, on radio, and it's, gone, uh, uh, and it's gone everywhere. So here, I say, yes, there are stories that I can say with moderate confidence originated with Russians. And if not that, then certainly got a boost from that. They are not the major framing stories. And they critically depend on legitimation and transformation by the right wing uh, media. Back to the point about mass media, and this is, and this is um, uh, critical because it's about trust. Trust and who give, gets trust and where. So we used in the book a 2014 version of this. Just last month, Pew came out with this uh, new version, but it's almost unchanged. Um, what do we have here? Republicans trust. This, remember, unlike this one, which I showed you earlier, which was about where they get news, this is about trust. They trust Fox News and Hannity Radio. They trust Fox News, but they also trust, in 30, 33% of them also trust ABC, CBS, 
and NBC. Um, if you break it down by more conservative and more moderate Republicans, more liberal and more moderate uh, uh, um, uh, Democrats, for the conservative Republicans, it's Fox News, Hannity Radio, and Limbaugh on radio that are the three most trusted sources. And for conservatives, the most distrusted are CNN, MSNBC, The New York Times, NBC, CBS. So it's really important to understand when you're trying to understand the diffusion that when you have a population that is sufficiently epistemically insular, that its attestation, its, its ability, its, its core source of truth is Hannity and Limbaugh on radio, alongside Fox News that includes Hannity and Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram all evening, uh, you get a much higher susceptibility uh, to tribal propaganda. When you have a more diverse set of sources you look at, and these sources are institutionally constrained. They're not perfect. You're not going to hear from me that the New York Times is perfect on this particular, on, 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 uh, and you'll see pretty soon, really not perfect. Um, but a completely different institutional framework and, and, and market uh, uh, pressure. So, David, you want to say what? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what does the science tell us? Dave, were you here when I sort of mentioned the thing of yours on deep fakes yesterday that you were? Um, what does the science tell us? Let, us? let me read out loud just from the abstract of what people have actually done careful work. Fake news accounted for nearly 6% of all news consumption, but it was heavily concentrated. Only 1% of users were exposed to 80% of fake news, and 0.1% of users were responsible for sharing 80% of fake news. Interestingly, fake news was most concentrated among conservative voters. Have I misrepresented what you wrote? No. Okay, same month. Again, this is same month, both of them in science. Um, uh, this, one, this one, by the way, Twitter, this Facebook, the two really most powerful, the two most powerful st studies actually trying to assess impact that have been published. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, we find that sharing this content was relatively rare activity on Facebook as well as Twitter. Conservatives were more likely to share articles from fake news domains, which in 2016 were largely pro-Trump in orientation than liberals or moderates. Again. We also find a strong age effect which persists after controlling for partisanship and ideology. On average, users over 65 shared nearly seven times as many articles from fake news domains as the younger age group. The kids are okay. It's the crazy uncle in the attic that's the problem. Um, I, I, that's the best evidence we have. Uh, what about the Russians in particular? This, other, this piece from, the P, uh, from PNAS, again, we, uh, um, this is assessing the impact of interaction with internet research agency Twitter accounts on six uh, uh, measures of political attitudes and belief. We also find that the interaction with IRA accounts was most common among respondents with strong ideological homophily within their Twitter network, high interest in politics, and high frequency of Twitter use, uh, usage. That is to say, the people who were touched by the Russians were the people whose views were already completely made up and were completely activated already. Unsurprisingly, they then conclude together these findings suggest that Russian trolls might have failed to sow discord because they mostly interacted with those who were already highly polarized. That's the best evidence we currently have about effect. So I'd like us to focus going forward on a particular framework of effect. First of all, evidence of activity can be enormously satisfying as an academic and scientific pursuit because it is hard being able to tell the difference between a bot and not a bot and a, and, and, and a Russian or not a Russian is really hard. You can do really good science work on it, but it is not evidence of impact. Individual level effects are not population level effects and that has a difference for different kinds of concerns that we may have. And everything I've talked to up till now, in terms of the Clinton uh, pedophilia, in terms of um, um, uh, the emails, etc., all of that is about shifting population level beliefs, not individual um, um, uh, positions. And question mark, I don't know that political beliefs operate in the same kind of media ecosystem as health or science. There's a lot more attention. There's a lot more targeted intentional propaganda 
And so the fact that I do think we see in health and science some seriously weird epistemic communities, um, uh, uh, that, uh, that doesn't mean that it's also the case for political beliefs and actions. So we need to look at individual changes in opinion for behavior. We need to look at population, average changes in opinion or behavior. Or we can come at it from the other side, see what were the top stories, frames, etc., and work back where did they come from. So what does that mean? I am not trying to tell you that individual level effects don't matter. The guy walks with a, with a, with a gun into Comet Pisa to self-investigate in a period where we have terrorist, racist attacks periodically is a genuinely important area of, talk, of, of study. If you can identify how those happen, how people get radicalized, I'm not saying that's not important, that's really important. It is not evidence of 46% of Trump voters believe, um, uh, et cetera. And neither is a single instance here or there of two groups being able to mobilize to be on the street. That's not what shaped the immigration debate. Happy to talk about what did at the larger scale from a different chapter from the book. Like I said, there are studies. The flat earthers seem, at least on interview, uh, data to really depend on YouTube. Uh, Anti-vaxxers uh, certainly have very strong uh, alternative uh, uh, media ecosystems from which to learn. And anti-vaxxers can really affect herd immunity regionally. Uh, so, so this is very real. Um, but again, we don't have, and this is why I emphasize these best of class papers assessing impact, we don't have evidence that they uh, uh, that they actually make the same difference in politics, and we have an easy explanation. The, the, the field is so um, um, flooded with mass media, with actually contested views from both sides, that discrete, the same kind of epistemic closure, the most you can say, that's an analogy, is that the entire 20, 20 to 30 percent of the population that lives inside the outrage industry is the equivalent of one of these flat earther communities. That it's, but that doesn't explain the extra 15 to 20 percent who read and listen and, 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 and watch ABC, CBS, and NBC. And they, to me, are the critical um, uh, population for intervention uh, uh, through these mass media that they most um, 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 respect. So let me, um, I want to make sure we have enough time for, um, for a good long conversation. So let me do the following and you'll, um, uh, you'll forgive me as I skim through various things that otherwise I would have spent another 45 minutes on. Um, First, when we look at how Clinton Foundation became a topic, we do see a really brilliant propaganda move. It just has nothing to do with Russians. So what do we see? We see an initial spike of focus on Clinton Foundation in May of 2015. We see a second spike in August of 2016. Where does this come from? If you look at all stories related to the Clinton Foundation, the New York Times is the largest. If you look at the specific story, it's Uranium One. Uranium One has these two cycles. I can talk happily about what happens here when Hannity and Crowd repurpose the story uh, uh, for purposes of, of, of uh, uh, hammering Mueller and McCabe uh, 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 and, and um, uh, 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 Rosenstein. But here what happens during the campaign is essentially the following story. You see here, this is the New York Times in April, May 2015. This is the New York Times again in August 2016. It's the same exact story. This is the story from April 2015. The headline on website, Pravda trumpeted President Vladimir Putin's latest coup, uh, mouthpiece of the Kremlin, Russian nuclear energy conquers the world. But the untold story behind that story is one that involves not just the Russian president, but also a former American president and a woman who would like to be the next one. This is not an edit. This is the original flow of the lead. Paragraphs 9 and 10, the New York Times examination of the Uranium One deal is based on dozens of interviews, as well as a review of public records. Unearthed by Peter Schweitzer, a former fellow at the right-leaning Hoover Institute and author of the forthcoming book, Clinton Cash. It might have been interesting to the New York Times reader to know that at the time he was editor-at-large of Breitbart, 
that the publication was supported by the organization he co-founded with Steve Bannon, the Ger Government Accountability Initiative, all of which was founded by Robert Mercer. That might have been helpful somewhere in the story. And then in paragraph 10, whether the donations played any role in the approval of the Uranium One deal is unknown. This then becomes the major legitimator for this entire right-wing system that's propagating the story and becomes the major story for the New York Times. I'm going to skim through quickly, but essentially uh, what happens is that, that Breitbart repurposes Clinton cash with specifically a Sanders supporters version that's intended to peel them off at the convention. It's released right at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, the second thing that happens is Judicial Watch, an anti-Clinton organization, through FOIA gets emails about the foundation, releases them, and then for a month these media have a ball digging into stories. I'll skim through. Um, I can't. <laughs> emails reveal how foundation donors got access to Clinton, blah, blah, blah. A sports executive who was a major donor to the Clinton Foundation wanted help getting a visa for a British soccer player. A crown prince of Bahrain whose government gave so-and-so to Clinton charity wanted a last-minute meeting. U2 rocker and philanthropist Bono wanted high-level broadcasting live link to international station. In each case, according to emails released Monday from Hillary Clinton, time as Secretary of State, the requests were directed to Clinton's deputy chief of staff, etc. Paragraphs 17, 18, and 20. There is no indication from the emails that Abedin intervened on behalf of Casey Wasserman, the LA sports executive. What did the emails say that nonetheless justified emails reveal how foundation got, donors got access to Clinton? Well, it said, Abedin says, makes me nervous to get involved, but I'll ask. Abedin wrote Band in May 2009. Band responded, then don't. <laughs> Band and Abedin also responded dismissively when asked if they had any idea how to help Bono get his space station transmission. No clue they each responded. Emails reveal how foundation donors got access to Clinton. Online? Have a little bit of fact checking? Uh, um, uh, orange uh, box? I'll leave this uh, for later. The bottom line, <laughs> too many stories. Um, high level. As Manafort's apartment was searched, Flynn was pleading guilty. John Solomon, who had been embedded in the Hill to be able to leverage their credibility, wrote an opinion piece. The Hill called it an opinion piece. Hannity called it investigative re reporting. Came out essentially with a repurposed Uranium One story. And that repurpose was, it turns out, these three lifelong Republican prosecutors helped Obama give, um, how did they put it on, um, on Fox and Friends? Russia got 20% of US nuke industry under Obama. Um, <laughs> we've been telling you for years, journalism is dead. <laughs> uh, but re they have, right? Remember, I told you, it's from 88 uh, uh, at least. The interesting thing that I just wanted to mention is that when we do a very, uh, a very scrappy version of the same thing for uh, Biden Ukraine, again, it's John Solomon on the Hill taking a Peter Schweitzer story and the New York Times writing this piece, which is actually better. They're being promoted by Trump and allies. But then as you read this 3,000 word piece, uh, at no point does it actually talk about its origins uh, in this piece of uh, propaganda, even though it's a story we already know and already told. Uh, and again, what you see, both visually, you see that the New York Times becomes a major source of legitimation for the right wing, and just numerically, when you compare the right wing versus the rest of the media, you see that the John Solomon story begins the story here of, uh, uh, of, uh, in the right wing media, but the New York Times has more attention from right-wing media than mainstream when the New York Times story comes out. It provides legitimation. In all of these cases, this is propaganda. It's propaganda designed to harness the credibility of the New York Times and the Washington Post to a particular political viewpoint that leverages the fact that none of these organizations have adapted to the fact that they're in the presence of an asymmetric propaganda system, 
and that they continue to practice neutrality very differently from journalists in countries where they know there's propaganda aimed at them. Turkish journalists, uh, we, we just had this conversation at Neiman, Turkish uh, journalists, Hungarian journalists, they understand that they're in a different game. The ones who were in the room in that conversation, they understood exactly what I was talking about. It's the American journalists who can't quite wrap their minds around the fact that the world has changed. And so they point to technology. Uh, okay, so what's, uh, what's, what's neoliberalism got to do with it? Um, uh, um, first of all, it's really important to understand this is the longest series we have about trust in, and this case is trust in government in Washington from the General Social Survey. Massive decline in the 60s and 70s, and then a gradual long-term decline uh, since then. Uh, and this is true if you look from 73, we have Gallup asking various institutions. It's true for Congress, for public schools, for organized religion, uh, for the medical profession. There's a long, long, decades long decline of trust in institutions. Um, it's not just a right wing phenomenon. So one anchor of it is the whole literature on rational actor model, agency capture, uh, positive political science, there's a big armature of, being, of skepticism about government that was a part of the neoliberal revolution and the effort to remove power from the state and locate it in the market. But at the same time, when the NATO raiders published the, the federal trade omission, uh, uh, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, all understood that the oppressive structures of government, whether they were national security, whether they were a model of patriarchal firm, there was a deep rejection of both left and right of authority structures, which was correlated essentially, which then got translated, don't forget, uh, uh, to, to the me generation. But essentially what, we're, what we see in the 70s is a transformation from a structure of ideology that focuses on expertise, standardization, and authority, national identity, you have, you have the family man, the company man that plays off across these multiple systems. In news, this is Walter Cronkite and broadcast. These then are modeled on a variety of institutions, um, essentially Treaty of Detroit labor relations, etc., and uh, technologies. And what we see in the transition since the 1970s is deregulation and privatization as institutional frameworks fitting the move to individualism and choice in free markets uh, uh, replacing managerism and welfareism and a whole set of technologies uh, uh, coming along with that. And you have both left and right versions of this. You have a lot more respect for equal opportunity uh, uh, for, for uh, gender and race egalitarianism, but you also have a, a, um, um, a loss of uh, a loss of stability and economic security. The result becomes, as we know, at least on the economic domain, the escape of the one percent, as we saw in Piketty and Saez's work. We see the stagnation of median wages. Since 1973, this is the stagnation of median income. This is Larry Mitchell's work. At, electronic, at, at Economic Policy Institute really was ahead of the game. And we know the things that we've learned from, from, from Case and Deaton, that essentially um, 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 white non-Hispanic population in the US is the only population in the Western world to have seen its mortality rates uh, rise. And that's primarily in high school educated and less um, uh, working class. Doesn't mean that their, doesn't mean that their uh, health outcomes are worse than black Americans. It does mean that the only population that the effect that, that there's been a change in direction. What we know from a gradually growing number of papers is that economic dislocation translates into support for populism. Because the reason for this increase in mortality are diseases of despair, suicide, cirrhosis, and opioid overdoses. Those are the primary explanatory. People are distressed and depressed and they cry out and they scream and they reject the elites that support them and with it the media that doesn't actually explain to them why their lives have gotten so much worse. And David Alter's work uh, shows that exposure to trade in the US is strongly correlated with more polarized political beliefs. Uh, Jan Algan and his team show the same thing for the rise of European populism. There's a completely different story. What we're seeing now is rejection of trust in elite media sources, but it's not driven by Facebook. <laughs> 
And the idea that we can somehow displace the genuine insecurity and genuine cries of, of, of uh, 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 pain through uh, uh, individual level interventions, uh, I think is a mistake. I'm not saying none of those matter, but we can't understand that as a systemic uh, challenge that we're facing. Instead, to my taste, if we actually think about uh, where, what we can do, these are some of the most exciting statistics. There really is overlap for enough of the population such that the population level political effects can be muted. The risk of acting without good evidence of impact on polit politics, I'm not talking health disinformation, I'm not talking individual terrorism, I'm talking large scale political outcomes at the population level, is that we're faced with this sense of loss of confidence in the political system, more or less wise intervention by private companies that start to see themselves as the stewards of democratic discourse, and worse perhaps of all, a, 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 a decline of academic normative intuitions among those who should know best and being willing to mix political inconvenience with a threat to democracy and a call for actual uh, uh, action. So what is, our, uh, uh, what is our duty as social scientists? I think at this point, that's not true two or three years ago, but at this point, it's to resist the panic and insist on clear persuasive evidence and worry that just like with terrorism, the autoimmune response can be worse than the actual threat itself. The threat is designed to induce overreaction and the overreaction is the source of the danger. That we have to resist. I want to go out. Lately, I've been thinking that the last honestly elected Republican president was Eisenhower. 68, South Vietnam, the connivance of Nixon and Kissinger, 72, Watergate, 1980. Now we know from David Rockefeller's release papers that there was work in the background to hold the hostages for Reagan, which probably implicates George H.W. Bush. <clears throat> 2000, the loser of the popular vote is given the the presidency by the Supreme Court, we know 2016. So on that higher level, how do you deal with what you're talking about, which is the granular level? So first of all, let's not forget Chicago in 1960. Uh, <laughs> it's, not one, it's not all one side though, uh, but... Um, I think there are structural bugs in the American electoral system. I'll rephrase that. I think there are intentional features intended to support rural minority voice, voice in the American electoral system that present a genuine problem. I think there are classes of problem like the influence of money in politics that are very real. I don't imagine that anyone here would claim that America is a perfect democracy. And I challenge anyone to identify any other country that, if you really know its inner workings, is a perfect democracy. Um, I do think it's worthwhile uh, uh, studying separately and discreetly the media ecosystem, how it's produced, at least, at least because that's occupies so much of the public conversation now. And to the extent that it's amenable to solution, it's amenable to completely different solutions. So I don't think it's everything. I think it's a component. I do think it's a meaningful component that's capable of being, that's susceptible to being studied separately and understood just in the same way that you can understand various discrete manipulations uh, differently. And I, and I would, um, we all have to get used to the fact that fallibility is everywhere. All systems are fallible. And whether we try to imagine an expert agency that will practice it perfectly as we did in high modernism in the post-war period, whether we try to imagine a perfect market price equilibrating, they're all wrong. All these systems are fallible. We need to understand that. We need to build for fallibilism. I agree.
But one of the ways in which you do that, I think, is by defining solvable problems at the right level of generality, that you can study them correctly and try to intervene in them correctly uh, and provide partial solutions. I, and that's the best I can do for this. There's a separate part of my work, I take off this hat, I put on another hat, where I'm trying to work exactly on the institutional foundations of neoliberalism and how it can play out and how it can change, which is again different from what you were talking about. It's about the, the, the foundation of people's economic insecurity. That's a separate set of issues that connects, as I tried to suggest to you quite clearly, but are separable and can be studied separately and, and responded to separately. I think we need to, otherwise it's just too big. The question I have is to what extent, I mean, your story here is very U US specific. Um, of course, the technological changes are global. Uh, the, the question, and the story you have here has very much to do with a particular institutional history in the US and so on. But to what extent are we seeing actually similar patterns throughout the world, which would suggest that the story about, that, that's all, all the US stuff you've been talking about is not really, it's not really about the US, but it's about a global change that's occurring everywhere. I don't know empirically to what extent we see similar patterns. I mean, I think we, we certainly, uh, I'll say, it's, uh, superficially seem to see similar things emerging uh, elsewhere, but I can't say that uh, rigorously. Uh, but to the extent that it's global, then, then it really isn't about U.S. Uh, institutional changes. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's, that's obviously the right question and critically important. We have two um, uh, studies, one in collaboration with colleagues at Sciences Po, one uh, that one of our uh, team is working on, looking at least at France and Germany. Uh, we don't find the same phenomenon. Uh, uh, France, in general, is a relatively, uh, um, France essentially is anchored on its mainstream media. Um, there's, uh, um, there's a bit of an anti-establishment thing going, but it looks like, uh, there, uh, uh, broadly speaking, people pay attention to their mainstream media without the same asymmetry that we find here. Um, Germany, the IFD really is quite separate, but the rest are more or less anchored and it's a much smaller component than it is um, uh, here. Uh, again, I'll just say about the fact that, th and I haven't yet talked about India or, or Turkey or, 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 or uh, Hungary, let me, I'll get there in a minute. Um, actually, no, I won't get there in a minute. Um, so there's that class of issues we also see the Sweden Democrats rising. We see uh, uh, even the Danish Progress Party. Um, we obviously see Modi and Erdogan and Orban, uh, Duterte. So there is something going on at a global level. And there's no question that the particular media of the moment is particularly outside of, um, um, let's call it, uh, Europe and the US, is much more um, um, on, on, on these devices than on anything else. Uh, so that's a real question. For Europe at least, A, the two countries we've looked at, we don't see similar patterns, and B, uh, I'll rephrase that. That's not yet a finding. We haven't published it. I don't, uh, that's an initial sense, very informal. But um, um, second, there are good studies that, that tie it much more to economic insecurity and instability. Um, so Jan Algan's uh, uh, group that came up with uh, uh, with the study for Europe really matched at the, at the very local level that um, uh, support for populist parties was very strongly predicted by change in level, by an increase in level of unemployment in that particular district. Um, um, uh, Algan also similarly did the piece on the yellow vests that showed that the strongest predictor, in fact the only meaningful predictor, was whether you came from a mid-sized provincial town where the, 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 the butcher and the baker, the butcher or the baker closed in the last five years. That is to say, social decline um, um, at the mid-level, not when you were totally in the periphery, not when you were at the core. So, so what you're seeing, so, so it's entirely possible that you're seeing global level effects in response to the Great Recession that broke certain kinds of, of uh, that broke certain kinds of, of um, uh, that, that, that had long,
that, that long suppressed anxiety, economic anxiety and political alienation blew up. And this just happens to be the way we communicate now. Uh, there's also, you know, if you look in detail at Orban, absolutely, he was pushing, th he was pushing his, his, his uh, push polls uh, through online media very early on and was very self-consciously using it. You look at Bibi Netanyahu's use of his chatbot, you have political actors very effectively using the most cutting-edge communications to play their game. Uh, but it's not as though radio wasn't plenty good enough in the 20s and 30s. Uh, so, so again, the, the putting the, locating the causal effect when you have such obvious alternative candidates that are much more structural and political, I, I, I'm, I'm not persuaded until I see it. This, this really resonates with a lot of stuff that we and others have been doing on, this, that suggests that a lot of the polarization uh, that people are attributing to motivated reasoning is just as consistent with everyone doing their best to understand the truth, but just working with very different information sets. Um, and so it seems like the question that it begs then is what do we do about it um, in terms of, and it seems like what you were suggesting is there's this chunk of people who are getting, who are not trapped only in the right wing bubble. But I, I guess the question is what should the mainstream news sources be doing if they sort of understood the new, uh, if journalists understood the new reality, you know, what's the answer to do about it? So, so Rob will be my, my, my witness here that as we were working on the solutions chapter, we kept bashing our heads against the wall and saying, nothing we can think of would be both effective and constitutional. Uh, <laughs> at least no policy interventions. Is that, is that fair, uh, would you say, or, or a little unfair? Um, um, which is why I'm trying to focus on those elements that can happen voluntarily through, um, uh, through well-intentioned professional activity. Uh, notice that in some sense I've given up on the 30% who live inside the outrage media. I think that they are like the flat earthers essentially. They, there's just a single closed epistemic framework, but they're not, um, uh, but they're not enough to win, as it were. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Imagine that the New York Times story about Uranium One were headline, Steve Bannon, uh, billionaire Robert Mercer funds effort to hit Clinton early with uh, propaganda. And then again with Ukraine, same model that lied about Clinton in so-and-so is now trying to go after Biden. And not detailed 33,000 words on Hunter Biden, but 3,000 words on Mercer on how Breitbart emerged in 2014 with a big bolus of money, how Breitbart was responsible for, framing, for forcing the Republican Party to focus on immigration and framing immigration in terms of um, uh, Islamophobia, uh, right? You, 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 that won't get fewer reads. So, so leveraging the fact that they need eyeballs, but understanding that the story is an asymmetric propaganda, not cash flow to Clinton Foundations as uranium went to Russia. Right, and appreciating that that's not biased. That's, not, like that's the point. That's the critical point. Understanding that neutrality in the teeth of a highly asymmetric propaganda system is complicity. That's, right, the world has changed and you keep doing the same thing. You're not doing the same thing. Uh, there were, you know, I've been to lots of talks, and especially with journalists, and I always ask this question, because I'm a journalist, and uh, I don't really see, I don't think there's that much change. There might be a little bit more awareness. There was a, a chance to talk to Jill sure. Abramson, the firm with New York Times editor. I asked her up front, um, and then she, I think she didn't hear my question, but then the person who was organizing it said she heard my question, but just didn't answer it. Um, so I think one really concrete thing is more outlets for the media critique, and there's not much. I mean, I can only think of two that are mainstream, Columbia Journalism Review, maybe maybe Neiman Labs. There's not a lot of um, uh, opportunity for um, 
critique and reflection about how the media is doing. So the media will keep doing it, and you have to feed the beast, and the reporter needs to find stories. Um, and if another outlet has the story, you have to follow and you have to chase. So um, there's some fundamental um, problems with um, how the industry works still. Do you think that um, the FCC Fairness Act could ever be reinvoked or something like that? No. Why? No. So the question is, would the Fairness Doctrine uh, uh, solve it? A, the Fairness Doctrine only applied when it did apply to over-the-air broadcast. It was highly imperfect even when it did operate. And by the mid to late 70s, uh, all activists on both sides of the political divide had learned how to use it to hit at outlets. Um, I can't tell you that I agree with, with um, uh, the, the Reagan FCC when they, when they uh, repealed it. But it was highly imperfect originally. And even then, if in fact you still had most of the media ecosystem just be over the air broadcast, it might have an effect. As things stand, I think First Amendment doctrine has moved far beyond where it was when the Fairness Doctrine was upheld in 1968. We have, for better and worse, I'm now not defending, I'm predictively, uh, there's no way it would pass a Supreme Court in the, um, um, uh, as it is today, where the use of your property, in this case, the broadcaster, would um, uh, work. Second, uh, I don't see it at all being, uh, even on its own logic, it couldn't be applied to cable, let alone to online. And so I, I just don't see it as sufficiently. So I don't think it would pass constitutional muster anymore. I don't think the, the horse is still in the barn that we could close the door. Uh, and, and so I think, and I'm saying that, I'm sorry if, if I'm sounding a little aggressive about it, uh, but, um, but I'd love for us not to spend political energy in a direction that I think is not going to work, even if it is passed and won't survive, even if there is a line that's passed. I think that's more nostalgia than solution. So I agree with you, and all, it makes a lot, everything you said makes a lot of sense around the mainstream media and the role that they play. But I was wondering, just coming back to social media platforms, if you could speak about um, what actions you would recommend for them, if like their orange boxes are not enough, or just in what role they play and what actions you recommend. Don't panic. <laughs> no, I'm 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 really serious, right? Your your everything I'm saying is that our focus on social media platforms at the moment is overwrought. What do I want? I want, um, I want social media platforms to start working in ways with, so Social Science One was a, was, uh, is an effort. We'll see what comes of it. We're seeing that it's extremely difficult with regard to uh, preserving privacy. But imagine a situation. Let's say I made a claim for why Russian propaganda doesn't work. Imagine the following story. All the platforms, let's say Facebook or Twitter now have an algorithm that runs and raises a red flag, this is a coordinated action. And then they take it down. Okay, I want a randomized experiment. I want them to, let, to randomly select some number to go through and then track them along these dimensions of does the thing they're trying to produce emerge in the major media ecosystem? Are the people that it touches, does anything happen to them? Do they change their views? Do they change their actions? Down at the individual level. Do that. Get to a level that you can have a science publication on that, and then let's figure out. Because here's the thing. It's not for the, so for the social media platforms to act is not costless. It actually means we're taking private companies and letting them play a critical editorial role in our network public sphere. That could be worth it if the assault is really impactful. If the assault at the end of the day is just noise, and the parties who actually make a difference are perfectly constitutionally protected in doing that, I don't know that I want Facebook and Twitter to be doing something I'm not willing. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Maybe the new oversight board will turn out to be uh, uh, the perfect democratically accountable body to, to cure uh, 
our, our public discourse. Maybe, and I, I, I know, I sound like I'm mocking. I didn't mean to mock. Uh, no, seriously, it's a really, really interesting institutional innovation. Am I skeptical? Sure, I'm skeptical. That's my role in life. But, uh, but, but um, uh, I, I, the, the very first thing for social media platforms to do now is find ways of assess, of allowing independent investigators. And this is critical, because if all they do is do internal Im uh, studies and say, nah, don't worry, we don't cause a problem, that's not going to do anything. <laughs> they have to find a way, and again, Social Science One is an effort in that direction, but precisely because several of us have been part of it, and we know just how hard it's going to be to make this data set actually tell us most of what we want to know, that I'm cautious about that being the solution and saying, we need a way for independent investigators, the same values underlying social science, independent investigators, independently funded, getting access to the data, uh, to assess, to fo focus first and foremost on assessing impact that matters. That's what we need to know. This is somehow in line to the previous comment, and it, it's true that as a social scientist, I'm trained as a linguist, and I do online discourse as part of my research. So this is somehow trying to add a bit of complexity to the whole thing. You've talked about Facebook and Twitter like this public discourse thing, but for me a uh, word of caution should be um, when we think about WhatsApp for example and you know like instant messaging applications how all this discourse is like in the past could be more public, they've been transferred to a more private sphere and the role that these channels may be having to forge ideologies is actually quite crucial especially considering this idea of trust that you mentioned before. We are witnessing like a total trust of luck, like this vertical trust, but this level of horizontal trust is actually getting, you know, more important. So the fact that we kind of send this kind of terrible fake news content, etc., through horizontal channels, like WhatsApp, for example, that's be like, in my opinion, that's having a key role important issue in countries such as Brazil, for example, Spain, where I come from, and all these ideas of these far-right populist parties get into power, stuff like WhatsApp, for example, is actually playing a massive role there. So what's your opinion on that? Like how to tackle, you know, spaces like that when privacy, for example, is just harder to access all these messages? So any, any thoughts on that? So look. Um, you made a factual assertion. WhatsApp plays a massive role in our politics. Maybe. Um, uh, that's certainly anecdotally what people are saying. There's some journalistic uh, uh, evidence. It's vastly harder to uh, study because the networks are closed. Uh, been one or two studies. There are real, um, 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 for academic researchers who are independent enough, there are real uh, constraints in terms of research ethics. So I think that's a very opaque part of the story. My own work, my, my, my own work from things that I do know about leads me to say, don't panic. Um, by which I mean what? Uh, the same things you're saying now about WhatsApp were said in 2016 about Facebook and Twitter. Upon careful investigation, it turns out that the thing that formed the foundations of the superb journalism and data journalism turned out on careful uh, scientific investigation to be big enough to take a big story and too small to have actually swayed the election. When I find a study like David's group on WhatsApp showing not 0.1% of sharing and 1%, but actually large-scale diffusion, I, I, I will accept it. As for now, dubitante. That's point one. Two, you call WhatsApp horizontal. Uh, certainly what we know from the way the BJP used it in the last election, 
certainly from the way in which the Likud in Israel used Facebook Messenger in the 755 election cycles in the last 18 months. Uh, sorry, I'm also, I, I, I'm a citizen of that democracy too, not only this one. Uh, <laughs> pick one. Uh, um, <clears throat> those are all top-down, center-periphery um, uh, models, not horizontal. And the attestation is, if you look at Bibi, it's the prime minister wants you to pick up the phone and call 100 friends. What, are you going to say no to the prime minister? Uh, so, so I don't think that it's a, at least what we've seen from the few studies in India, Brazil, and Facebook Messenger in Israel, it's not horizontal attestation. It's circumventing the open media to do stuff that would be too embarrassing to do in closed media. And that's, again, I don't know that it's not horrible, terrible, no good in terms of effect. But I do have enough experience now with how worried we were about prior things to say, show me. From what I read about, it seems to me that the biggest impact on the media ecosystem in the form of technology and maybe also private equity financialization is the decline of uh, local news sources and the layoffs uh, across news organizations. And I wonder how that contributes to this picture. Does it make it more fallible? Does it sort of create, is it sort of a different world we live in where there's like every, every other news source has cut their Washington bureau so much that you need to rely on the Uranium One story from the New York Times and you repost that? How has that sort of changed the system? Uh, so I don't think the effect has been at the level of national news so much because precisely as you suggest, there are enough people focusing on that and then people just syndicate. Uh, and that's been true for, for papers for a long time with AP and Reuters uh, syndication. Um, the, the big question is what happens to state level politics, to regional politics. Uh, and I think that's a genuine concern. Um, uh, um, I think it's a, it, it's a related but distinct problem from the problem of disinformation and misinformation. It's about just creating the information at all from a source that's, uh, that's, that's feasible. I think the decline of, of, of uh, local media, although people want to pin it in some sense on Facebook and the internet, um, in many senses, Warren Buffett already warned in a letter to investors in 91, based on cable and high-speed magazine production, mm -hmm. that owning a newspaper was no longer a license to print money. So he has a 1984 letter that says, Buffalo, uh, um, um, Buffalo News, we, we own it, it's great, it's a license to print money. By 91 he says, nah, not going to be so great. Mostly what happened is that they built local monopolies for distribution purposes, and monopoly is a great thing to have if you can own it. Once you actually get more diverse media, uh, much harder to use. As Marcus Pryor wrote about 12, 13 years ago, a lot of the displacement isn't to the national news. It's exactly to sports and entertainment and, and, and whatever else it is. You don't have to watch the news at 6 o'clock because there's something else going on too. Um, uh, I don't think that that primarily contributes to the misinformation, disinformation vector. Um, and the solutions there are going to have to be, again, uh, like science, like non-popular like non arts, information goods or public goods, if we don't have decent public funding to deliver basic public goods, we get under provision of basic public goods. We just somehow, be, be, not just somehow, because, um, uh, because we are worried about government funding of news differently than we are about government funding of medical investigation, uh, uh, we have genuinely higher concerns. The American model um, um, uh, ever since the beginning of the 20th century, not before, right? 19th century journalism is, is very much about party, um, um, uh, party funding and, and Frank, uh, I mean, there's a reason they're all called the post this, the post that, because you got to be the postmaster if you gave me good news. 
Um, uh, but that was 19th century. We had professionalization and, and the whole rise of objectivity and neutrality in the 20th century uh, with the professionalization of journalism. Uh, and with it came the deep belief that somehow Pulitzer and Hearst were independent because they only wanted to sell copy and didn't actually. Uh, and we have 50 or more years of media criticism about just how imperfect commercial media are. So I don't want to overstate how wonderful local media were versus now. I think it's a distinct problem from disinformation. I think if it's going to be solved, we're going to have to solve it through some form of dramatic public funding uh, increase, and I wouldn't hold my breath. Mm -hmm. so we're going to have to end it.